everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Hope it's a lovely day where you are. It's sunny where I am here in Prague. My name is Tatiana Stadnik and in my daily work, I support climate activists and advocates. And today I'm going to moderate the discussion on the environmental sustainability of the music industry. Well, although music is intangible, the environmental cost associated with music has never been higher than it is now. For instance, the 2019 research from the University of Glasgow and the University of Oslo found that the greenhouse gas emissions associated with music consumption have grown significantly since just the year 2000. And I'll link the studies in the description to the session, so go ahead and see it. Now, this particular study that I mentioned focused in particular on the effects of music streaming. And we know there are other sources of the industry's carbon footprint that are also the sources of the income for which the majority of artists rely upon, such as merchandise and the live shows, well, at least before COVID-19. And we know the impact of these things, especially the live shows, for instance, from the ecological footprint and carbon audit of Radiohead US tours. Again, we'll link to the description of the session. Although we're still in the middle of the COVID crisis, we are here today to discuss the other ongoing crisis we should not forget about and to find out how we can play our part in reducing the environmental impact of the industry. Together with Feimata Conte, Osterberg Soleimanov, Vlad Yaramchuk and Clementine Bunau, who are here as guests today. I would like to invite the guests to introduce themselves and what they do in just one sentence for now, starting with Feimata. Hi, I'm Pamata Conte. I'm the Environmental Sustainability Manager for the Manchester International Festival, which is a biannual festival um, of multi-art forms that takes place in Manchester every two years. Hi, guys. My, my name is Otabek Soleimanov. I'm from Tashkent, Uzbekistan, and I'm producer of Stihia Electronic Music Arts and Science Festival, which is held annually in a very distant place of our country, and possibly one of the most distant places in the world called Muinak. That's where the Arali Sea used to be. The festival's mission is to raise the awareness about the environmental issues. Vlad Yaremchuk here from Atlas Weekend Festival, Ukraine. I'm the booking manager of the festival. It takes place annually here in Kiev, Ukraine. Um, hello, I'm Clementine Bunel. I work at Paradigm Agency. Myself and my fellow agents are making sure the touring we produce uh, is sustainable. And I'm also the chair of the uh, green team uh, at Paradigm London. Thank you so much for your brief introductions. To open the discussion, we have asked the speakers a few questions in advance. Among these questions, there are have you noticed any shifts towards environmental sustainability in your countries? Are the questions of environmental sustainability on the agenda in your career or in the projects that you do? What brought you to it? If yes, how can we play a part in reducing the environmental impact of the music industry? And what solutions do you see for your projects, your organization or your company? So I would like to ask Feimata to go ahead and answer these questions in up to five minutes. Sure. So I might not answer them in, in uh, the order that you've asked them, Tatiana, but they've been giving me some interesting things to think about. So I've worked in sustainability for over 10 years, starting uh, with community engagement and then working in technology development uh, in academia um, and across the arts. And what I'm really passionate about, and I was thinking about this, like, why, why do I enjoy the, the things that I do is like, I'm really excited about the ideas that can emerge when you bring people together. And I think that happens a lot in, in the music industry. I've been thinking a lot about festivals and the spaces that they create where people encounter new ideas and new ways of thinking, and then how people can bring that into their, into their, their everyday lives. So uh, Manchester International Festival, it's a festival of, of all new commissions working with different artists every year across a range of art forms. And I think that gives, um, a really great opportunity for artists to encounter things that they might not have considered before. And I think that's often a really good place to open up conversations about sustainability, because when you enter into a festival uh, site, so whether that's a, you know, a Greenfield music festival or an arts festival in the city, 
you're open to, to new ideas. So I think that's often a space you can have conversations with, with people about how you can change the world in, in different ways. So I have noticed shifts around um, environmental sustainability uh, in the arts in the UK. I think over the last sort of five to 10 years, it's become a much more um, prominent conversation. Um, and I think one of the very visible ways it, it's come across in, in, um, in the music industry and in, in music festivals is around um, discussions around waste. I think there's been a big conversation around, particularly around plastic waste. So I know a lot of festivals in the UK, for example, have banned the use of single use plastic bottles. So Glastonbury and, and big kind of festivals like that, because it's something that's very visible that, that the audience kind of um, um, support. I think um, so there's a report that's come out in the UK, which I'll, I'll share the link with you to, to go through this, which is about the environmental impact of, um, of music festivals. And in that it was saying, 83% of festival goers expect the festivals that they attend to be doing something about their environment. So there's this kind of really nice coming together with the expectations of, an, of the audience and also um, kind of the desire of, of people within the industry. Um, so yeah, so the, there's reducing waste, um, which then can I think lead to having conversations around ideas around circular economy. So maybe not just the waste of like things that you're buying to consume in the festival, but actually what are we making everything out of in the festival? How are we approaching those things? So one of the things that we're looking at for uh, the Manchester International Festival is thinking thinking about that, like what are the materials that we're using to, to build our festival, our sets and our, our, our stages out of? And what are we doing with them after the festival? It, it, we just feel like it's no longer good enough to just say, well, we're just going to throw all of that away. Because I, I remember this from, from a talk somebody gave a, a long time ago that I went to is like, there is no away. So that idea of like, there isn't, we're not throwing this somewhere else. We're throwing this into our own environment. We, we're, we're all on this world. So there is no away. So actually, what can we, what can we do with our waste streams? Something that I'm um, interested to explore more and um, in terms of um, building connections around waste is looking at uh, composting so I would be so excited to see uh, more composting happening um, at festivals. So that's food waste. I know there's a lot of, uh, more use of kind of compostable uh, plates and, and cups and things like that. And then using that to produce um, something that, 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 that um, could be used in sort of community gardens or, or in other spaces around the city. So, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot that I can see has been happening um, uh, in the UK sort of building on this. And then something else that I just wanted to mention, just to see if people were, were aware of it, is um, work that Massive Attack have been doing with um, the Tyndall Centre for Climate Research, which is actually based in, in Manchester. So really looking into the environmental impacts of touring and what can be done around that. So I think it's a lot of conversations are opening up and I think there's um, some actions that are being taken. But as with all of this, there needs to be more and it needs to be faster and hopefully by sharing knowledge and information from you know, different places around the world and hearing what people are doing, then that can support us to take uh, greater action. I don't know if I've hit five minutes yet, but. <laughs> Thank you, Feimata. Uh, indeed, there's, there's no way, and I'm happy that there is this narrative going ahead. And also how powerful music is in the end of the day. We have the feeling, we, we have been feeling the, the collective action we have been feeling like we're not alone for decades for centuries when you're at the music mm -hmm. concert when you're in the festival you have this feeling and then when you come together just you you have the idea that you need to do something for the environment and you come mm -hmm. together with all of these same people that you have been coming together for decades already and you do something mm -hmm. as a collective that is indeed powerful thank you so much mm -hmm. um otabek i would like to move the discussion to you yes Thank you, Tatiana. Well, um, I come from a place where we have probably witnessed one of the worst environmental disasters on Eurasian continent. Uh, that's where the Aral Sea, uh, one of the fourth lakes, the Saline Lakes, used to be the fourth in the world, is the size of Georgia or Switzerland or Estonia, has disappeared uh, during the last 30 years. And that has led to the uh, to the one of the uh, most acute crises in Central Asia, not only in Uzbekistan but also in uh, neighboring Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, 
the sandstorms, the salt storms, uh, the horrible decrease of uh, health conditions of living people there. Uh, I don't know, in, uh, in other countries, probably that part would be declared as an emergency zone with a total evacuation of, of people, but it hasn't been done yet. So this is a very acute environmental problem in our country that creates a lot of social, economic, health, even political tensions. And uh, for all these decades, that problem has never emerged. And, and until recently, maybe five years ago, four years ago, when our government has changed, uh, we have new president now who, who is more liberal, He's uh, very open-minded. And that was the time when coincidentally, I was at Moinak, that is the, what used to be port town. And I traveled there on my other business. And while standing there at the shores, what used to be the shores, and now it's a complete desert. And you have this a mixed emotion of, of, of seeing what, I mean, this is incredible, almost impossible to believe that the humans can actually do to, to the environment. You see almost 30 or 40 meters of a shore, uh, of a cliff. And you understand that this whole place was once uh, filled with water, with a fish, with a, its own flora and fauna. Now it's gone. Now we have 4 million hectares of desert and we don't know what to do with that, okay? Of course, there's no point of trying to deliver the water back. You will need to go back by a time machine to the 40s or 50s probably and change the entire Soviet cotton campaign that has resulted in this. And, but the problem with the environmental change, and we've been telling this all the time on the festival, but in all the other places where we can, is that it's, it is happening, but the problem is that it is happening very slowly. It's not a volcano, it's not an earthquake. It's not something that you can see with your eyes just developing you know, immediately. Environmental change and impact happens so slowly that you have to be very cautious and you have to be very accountable in order to pay attention to that, okay? And that is why what you're doing, guys, is incredible. And uh, all these initiatives, all these uh, activists, enthusiasts, I think these are the heroes of the, pres heroes of the present time. The heroes, the real heroes, because they do that with their enthusiasm, uh, altruism, I don't know what to call it. And I think our team from Stihia Festival is also part of that team. Uh, it's a non-profit festival. Uh, we don't sell tickets. It's an open space. It's, it's located uh, in one of the most distant places in the world. It's really difficult to get there. The DJs, the ravers who travel there, uh, it's one of their lifetime achievements, to be honest. Someone from, I think it was from Lonely Planet, they called uh, uh, the Stihia as an Everest of one of the Everests for DJs and ravers. Really difficult to get there. But the reason why we do that is to talk to speak out about this problem of RLC loudly in a figurative and a literal way. We put one of the most powerful sound systems there and we bring techno, electro and acid music just to make it very, very novel, uh, very beautiful event that will bring more attention. And by bringing more attention to that place of the world, we of course say that, well, we do that because we want humans to know that this is happening. We're right there standing at the shores, what used to be the sea, we're filming that, uh, people come there. You know, you would, be, you would be amazed that people, even from Uzbekistan, have never been there before the festival started to, um, you know, to occur uh, in 2017. It started very sporadically, it was a very small event, but then it turned, even like within the last three years, it turned into something bigger that is not only playing music, and this, we've been always stressing that uh, to the locals and to the community that is not, we're not partying there, okay? And that is why the, we are, have this dilemma that the Stihia is a nonprofit event, but still we do not have an objective to become popular. It's not 
place where you go to entertain yourself, right? This is a place where you go to come to have the compassion to share the mission by just simply getting there, which is quite difficult. And, and that is why it turned into something bigger than event of music, including the research, including the forums where people share the knowledge about why this happened. Has there been an anthropogenic factor or is it simply natural disaster? We don't know. Thank you so much, Adabek. The example that you have put forward is one of those disasters that I guess humanity will be regretting for centuries ongoing. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for, for inviting us into your festival. I had the feeling like I'm present there with your description and you painted the picture for me. Thank you so much for yeah. that. Yes, yes. We'll go ahead with blood. So yeah, uh, let's start from what I think about what is happening in our country currently in terms of eco-sustainability and everything. I can say that things are definitely getting better because obviously as a country we are not as developed as most of the European countries, so there is always a lot of catching up that we have to do. But it's definitely been getting on people's agendas recently and the artists are getting involved more than ever. We have videos, we have songs written about this crisis, we have a lot of grants that are being given out, so everyone starts to speak about it and people who are more progressive are definitely getting to sort their ways, do everything. But our mission as a festival, since we are the biggest music festival in the country, we had more than half a million people in 2019, it gives us a special chance to speak to so many people, especially because the first day that we do at the festival is free. And in 2019, it was attended by, by more than 150,000 people. And those, those are all kinds of people because it kind of turned into a sort of national celebration kind of thing. And we try to use our festival as a great tool, as a great educational tool to get a chance to speak to those people. For that, we have a huge team of ECHO volunteers who we also read lectures to so that they can answer to everybody's question, catch people out of the blue at the festival, tell them how to sort their waste, try to do our best to come up with really fun activities that engage those people so that they, you know, again, what, what Feimata was talking about, it will make them feel like a part of a whole. It's not only about them at their own initiative, oh, I'm sorting my waste, I'm doing a good job. No, it, it becomes like this team fun activity, which is what we are trying to achieve. So our journey with sorting waste and with everything finally started in 2018. It's always been in our mind, but the whole festival was a bit of a crazy gamble to put together. So we couldn't really get involved from the head start. But in 2019, we started sorting and recycling our waste. It was 2.3 tons in 2018. We had four sorting stations, but in 2019, it was already five tons, 100 volunteers and partnerships with sponsors and governmental agencies that helped us with that. One fun thing that we have is an alley of uh, community organizations where you go in and you have a lot of those organizations by the community. Some of them have to do with ecology, others have to do with people with disabilities and stuff. And it's, it's a quest kind of affair where you just have a card and you go around those organizations and one of those teach you how to use a wheelchair so that you can put yourself uh, in that spot and see how those people feel and how important it is to care about them. And we have those for ecology where you were taught to sort waste and you were shown the examples of what happens when you don't really care about it. So we just, we just use everything at our disposal, especially like getting to work with the artists and with the sponsors to push the agenda of eco-sustainability. We ourselves try to do a lot and we hopefully going to be trying new generators and trying to move away from diesel, which has been a successful affair in Europe from what I know with the programs like Everywhere where they have the new hydrogen fuel cells. We really hope we'll get a chance to try those out at least step by step. One of the problems with the festival is that it is so huge 
that it is kind of hard to implement new new steps in terms of doing the eco sustainability, but we can also roll it out one by one. So hopefully in like 2022, we can try to make one stage as ecological as possible and then kind of spread it out to all the other stages and stuff like that. We started signing festival ambassadors, which is basically taking Ukrainian local artists and like having a more long term relationship with them and especially to use them as this influencer voice to the people because I think it's it's best when you use like your heroes and your favorite musicians and when they speak about something you definitely try to listen so we're trying to push that as much as possible to have them shoot videos to talk about it to have those different interactions with the festival and same with the brands I mean, one of the reasons our festival is as big as it is, is we know how to work with sponsors, but sponsors are also, we kind of teach them to make every brand deal they do with us, to make it interesting, to make it something that people will remember instead of just, you know, blasting their names all over the place. So we come up with fun activities that have their brand in it, but then it has to do with eco sustainability, which makes it even better. So it's, it's basically all about us trying to use our scale and what we have to prepare people. Because I would say that the infrastructure in Ukraine in general is not there yet. Like it's not easy for you as a person, for your household to recycle your waste. You have to spend a lot of time and money to do that. The government doesn't give you enough tools to make it easy for you. But it's slowly getting better. We have a contractor who takes our waste and sorts it out even further. So it all it all comes together. But we want to prepare people for the gradual change because I feel like at least in five years time it will be a much bigger deal here and everyone will be starting to take part in it. But by that time we want to make sure everyone understands why and how it's done. And basically our festival and its scale is, is our chance to speak to as many people as possible. And that's that's pretty much about what we do. Thank you so much, Vlad. Thank you. Uh, it's very interesting to hear how you are using the avenue that you have, the festival that you have in all possible ways from the education to working with sponsors to actually preparing the society and laying down the basis for the future of the, the environmental awareness or even for the infrastructure that is not yet creating a demand for that in the society. Half a million people are attending your festival. Wow, I think this is a success. This is something that definitely should be proud of. Um, just as well as uh, um, the other speakers with your uh, projects. But this is not it. We have not finished yet. Clementine, please go ahead. So I guess... Um... From where I stand, um, the two outstanding, um, um, I would say, objectives and issues is A, to get our own house in order, i.e. Um, making sure that people who work in agencies, people who work in music are trained on what is sustainability because obviously it goes beyond not using the Nespresso machine, you know, it goes beyond ditching the capsules. Um, and, and I think sustainability is very much high on the agenda um, on, from, you know, from the point of view of festivals, artists, ourselves, but to get there, we felt when we started that green team task force that we needed to make sure everyone in the company was trained. And so uh, we're having someone uh, coming on a regular basis, giving you know, giving us perspective and knowledge on what sustainability is when it comes to working in the live music industry. You know, what is sustainable food? What is what are sustainable materials? The impact of travels, because you know, as agents, um, we travel and we think it's normal to just hop on a flight for a gig and come back the next day, um, but really you know, how much, how much damage do we do? Um, um, and so that's why I think getting our house in order was um, key. Um, the second big, um, I guess, big subject in the company is how we get 
our artists in a position where they can they and festivals can adhere to what we call a green rider um you know we we want to be able to get to a point where what we call a green rider is something that is going to become a legal thing down the line when we you know when we work with festivals and venues um and obviously there's been over the past you know 10 15 years riders you know <laughs> all artists have got some you know you know amazing uh, creative ways of uh, <laughs> of making their riders uh, difficult to comply with but um i think we it's you know as agents as people working in the live music industry it's about you know it's about consolidating a rider that we call a green rider a resource that everyone can access um and something that we can get adopted by all festivals and venues without posing local issues not not every country has got the same agriculture not every country has got the same power supplies so really a format that would translate borders um, it's a big project but one where all part of the industry have a have got a role to play and that includes us as agents um, i think the, the 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 other thing i I feel um, I should mention is that a big project we have for 2022 um, is to do a green arena tour assessment. So we're going to be working um, with some of our uh, big arena artists from the booking of the tour through to the delivery of the tour, uh, working with the artists, their production team, the tour managers, and basically um, we're gonna um, we're gonna issue scores from improvers to outstanding. Uh, it will involve you know working with them from the design phase of the tour when it begins its production to the choice of the venues, uh, communications with the audience, CO2 analysis through to the delivery of the tour. Obviously, there's a lot of shifting due to COVID uh, and a lot of tours that are being, you know, moving moved to 2022. But that's a big, uh, that's going to be a big focus to us. And, you know, despite, um, I would say that despite the feeling that maybe the environment got a break from, you know, from us humans um, during that COVID time, essentially it hasn't really you know we've been littering uh the world with ppe and masks and um and you know our oceans are filling with um single use masks and and i think we have to bear in mind that moving forward it's not it's going to go beyond and maybe environment is going to be even more important because the world paused for that year um because as um you know, it, it doesn't go away. And so I think, you know, what happens if we have to live with restrictions, you know, when festival goers go with, you know, with their masks, I think there's going to be a, a whole lot of education, educating to be done. Um, so yeah, sorry if I've overrun. Thank you so much. I was, when I was preparing to this meeting, I was wondering about the writers a lot. This was one of my biggest questions. How would you as an agent deal with the musician, with an artist, with a band that just write a whole ton of things, but the one that are completely unsustainable in their writers, how to deal with it? And I'm happy to hear that you were acting as, uh, as the person who is directing or as a community of agents are directing their artists. And also I'm happy to hear that there is the green writer thing that you were thinking to implement on the on the uh, policy level, so it would be legal for for, for uh, a wider community. Thank you so much, everyone, for this intro. And I would like to go ahead and jump straight to the Q&A. And my first question, I believe, would be direct, directed mostly to Vlad, Feymata and Otabek, since they are directly engaged with the festivals. So um, most of you have mentioned, you, you definitely have mentioned that there is this green trend on making festivals more sustainable, banning single-use plastic. Some festivals, I know they have been banning meat and fish. It, it cannot be sold anywhere around the festival. But my question would be around the following. These initiatives, they're tackling the most visible issues. 
this can be essentially good marketing at the, aimed at young people who are worried about the climate crisis and they don't want to feel like going to the festival and, and having fun, um, essentially goes against their core values. So uh, in my opinion, there is this danger. So when the young people or in general, the attendees of the festival, when they see uh, all the branding around the festival going green, reducing waste, um, it might make them feel that, okay, this has been tackled, so I can relax, we are good, we're getting there, we're getting better. But when it comes to the real decrease and the carbon emissions and, and thinking about how we travel to the festivals, how the fans travel to the festivals and so on, these sides of the environmental footprint might not be tackled. Um, and there have been also evidence that some festivals, for instance, they say, sell themselves as sustainable, but they offer the, visitor, the, wis the visitors a chance to win a new petrol car, or they're booking <laughs> an artist that are flying to the festival in a private jet, which is essentially greenwashing. Mm -hmm. So have you yourself witnessed the examples of the greenwashing or have your projects been accused of greenwashing? Um, it's, it's before I started um, at MIF, I, yeah, I have been unmuted, but I, I know that in the, the last festival, so that would have been in 2019, um, there was a, a, some small Twitter storm or some, something that happened basically, which it seems like a very small example, around the plastic cups that were being used uh, in, the, in the festival site. So there's an area we have which is called Festival Square, which is public uh, access, it's open all day, it's there for everybody. And we've made a decision to use um, cups which were made from bioplastic, which I think is something that, that people are starting to, to use more. So these are these are cups which are compostable, um, but actually there are very few places within the UK where you can compost them. But, you know, the festival had worked out how, how to do that. But to uh, to the audience, they just look like standard plastic cups. So it's just like, well, well, why are you using, you know? So it feels like sometimes audiences can focus on something that's, 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 that seems quite small, has a very small footprint in it, but it has a very big visibility. So it's about that that balancing what, what's very visible to the audience and actually what has the biggest impact and finding ways of, of, of telling those stories. So I think it, it is very interesting thinking about where people might be accused of, of greenwashing and where people might be accused of kind of just paying sustainability like a, a lip service, like a face value thing. And I think it's important for, for us as, um, you know, people working in the arts, people working in festivals to kind of use that as a start of a conversation with people and not be afraid of kind of where people might be critical about some decisions that, that you have made, because actually, you know, like as, as Vlad is talking and, and things are there, so we're not able to tackle everything all at once. But if you're able, to, if you can say to people, OK, well, we've done that this year, this is what we're planning to do next year. And this is what we're this is where we're, we're heading towards. And um, I think that can be quite, quite powerful. And also to acknowledge that you're not going to get everything right first time. Nobody. That's how we learn, isn't it? You, you try something, it works or it doesn't work. And then you, you try again. Vlad, I was interested in, in what you were saying about um, powering stages and things. It's like you're not going to be able to do that across your whole festival all at once. But you try it with one stage in the first year. You see what works and you take the learnings from that. And um, I've just been responsible for writing a new environmental policy for, for Manchester International Festival. And what I did in that is I looked at what values we say we have as an organisation. And then I mapped what that means for us in terms of sustainability. And one of the sentences that I put in there is like, for us, sustainability is a journey. It's a, it's, it's not just this is what we're doing. We're, we're working towards something and we invite everybody to travel with us. And the, the, the idea that I had in that is like, when you set out on a journey and you're not entirely sure where you're going, you kind of, you're walking towards a point on a horizon, but you, you haven't got your map yet. And also sometimes when you're on a journey, you stumble, you know, you don't, every step doesn't always land perfectly, but you don't just kind of sit down and go, well, that was it. I didn't manage it. You kind of pick yourself up and go, well, okay, I wasn't going the right direction then. Let me now try and go in the right direction. And maybe Otterbeck, when we're going on all of these journeys, we'll make our way to, to where the Aral Sea used to be. And what I really liked about what you were saying there, it's a, it feel, feels to me that that festival is about bearing witness. It's about people being able to see for themselves this is this is where we can get to as humanity, but also 
there's the hope of what we can do as humanity. We, we, we're not just destructive people. There's also creativity there. That is why, Fimeta, we're not answering to Tatiana's question. <laughs> uh, we're, not, we're not greenwashed, claimed of greenwashing, because, well, the, the mere fact that you're getting there, it, mm. it's a big deal. And, uh, of course, we try to, you know, the waste management, we try mm -hmm. to get, gather all garbage to put in one place. That's all by the standards. But, but uh, what, what we've been trying to plan this year is that, interestingly, there is a one special tree. It's a small tree that grows only in that part of the world. It's usually eaten by camels. And that the only one of the few uh, plants that can actually grow in the desert in that part of the world. So the, the seeds of that tree are so small that we're now partnering with one of the local producers of uh, paper cups and, and plates that can put those seeds into that cups and, and, and plates. So when people actually, they will be, uh, they will be in, encouraged to, <laughs> to throw the caps and plates as much they can into the desert. So once they, once they have a rain, it may decompose and actually plant the seeds, you know, that's one thing. And the second thing is that we set up a fund called Six Billion Trees. And because we counted, you need six billion trees to cover entire four million hectare a desert that is now in the place of RLC. And, uh, and each time we hold the festival, we, we, we do that, we, we plant trees. I mean, the DJs, they plant the trees, um, the, the, whomever comes to the festival, we give them one plant, we give them a spade, and we tell them, plant it anywhere you want. And there are only a few types of trees that can grow there. And by doing that, we say, well, look, th these are very few things we can do in order to, to, to help that region. And uh, of course, the waste management, the, 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 that thing kind of things are still not that, I would say, and not in the very strict agenda, because when you go there, as Femita, you, you mentioned, you, you, you actually put it very correct. This is a place of witnessing. You go there to the spot where everything happened, and you say, gosh, how can humans do that? You know, and this feeling that we want attendees to bring themselves back to their homes. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Also, thank you for pointing out the concrete examples of what you're doing along. Yeah, thank you. Thank Let's you. jump to the next question. Um, and I would like to invite uh, Clementine and Vlad to answer to it. I would love to have all the speakers answering all the questions, but the time restriction is there. Um, we have talked about the sponsors also a lot, and um, many of you have mentioned that there is this emer emerging um, opportunity of getting the sponsorship, getting the um, the money essentially to fund your transition to the greener practices. And along with the grants, along with the um, foundations that are willing to support you and the governments obviously that are willing to, to support you there are also the fossil fuels company that are that want to give their money to you to to use it for sustainable practices or for making your events or your tours more sustainable uh, and um do you do you select do you have a certain system to select the sponsors or do you look at where their money are coming from Yes, I mean, when it comes to, like I've said, working with the sponsors, it's, again, we, we are trying our best to try and present them with the, like, the brightest of ideas that we have, so that they feel like instead of just trying to put their name all across the festival, they are getting involved in something really good, and then we together, us as a festival and the sponsor, present, like, an, a good eco-sustainable measure together and obviously they would buy into that because that 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 is that brings much more positive impact to everything than just people won't remember seeing seeing like their posters everywhere but they will remember engaging in an activity that also feels like you've done something good for the environment and going back to that point um uh, so yeah, I mean, USAID have been really good when it comes to Ukraine with helping to get grants and get projects going. We have a good, really good trade deal with the UK signed between Ukraine and the UK. 
and that one's bringing a lot more grants as well. We have applied with one of the UK promoters in Birmingham for a grant that will let us shoot a documentary with the artists uh, following their journey and trying to figure out how to make their touring and their message more clear and how to make everything more sustainable. So there are definitely definitely a lot more opportunities than there were. And it's, I mean, when it comes to sponsors, we are always trying to be more initiative and just try to sell them ideas that we'll, we think will stick more. And when it comes to the UK and European Union and the USA, they're definitely looking towards Ukraine because on general, our ecological situation is not looking good at all, but they are very willing to get involved. And we are happy to be the agent of that and to get all of those opportunities and try to put them to good use. So that's how things are looking in terms of the grants here. And it's definitely looking great within the last two years, for sure. I think um, there's, there's, there's a big... There's a big level of accountability when it comes to, um, you know, sponsors, when it comes to, um, you know, brands and companies um, reaching out to us. Not only, you know, if, if I'm talking about, you know, a, a concrete thing, you know, live streams, for example, you know, and they're. And, and how much they cost to the environment, you know, how much it costs to have 80,000 to, you know, a million people tuning in at the same time everywhere, you know, at different parts of the world. And, and I think a lot of artists, maybe a few years back, were more, would have reacted saying, oh, that sounds interesting, that's a big brand. Um, but now artists, the first thing artists are asking is, are they really, you know, are they really environment you know compliance with sustain sustainability do we want to be associated with those brands and those sponsors um and so when i talk about accountability i think that you know before we go to the artist it's actually our duty to look into where the money comes from because you know it's very well to be coca-cola or total and to want to save the world but you know um i guess i guess I guess there's a degree of having to do, you know, to, to clean your own house first. Um, um, but I would, I would also, I also wanted to, um, I also wanted to say that from where we stand, um, obviously we work very closely with a greener festival, which is a UK company with Claire O'Neill, who's uh, amazing and who's um, going to be someone we're going to be working closely with. And, I guess from our side, we're more going to help raise funds through the artists we work with, um, through, you know, collective actions um, in order to raise awareness. You know, we have that power, I guess, you know, we have the power of artists that have, you know, millions of fans they can reach out to directly uh, on their socials. Um, and and yet we need to, you know, we, we need to make use of that power. Absolutely. And my last question is very much a follow up to what Clem, you have just mentioned that the artists indeed, they do have a lot of power. There is a strong following. Um, so my question is the following. There's unfortunately just as much that we can do on an individual level or as a society as a whole to decrease the, the total environmental footprint. And this is unfortunately not enough in the light of the fact that just a hundred companies, most of them in the fossil fuel industry, they are responsible for over two thirds of worldwide carbon emissions. According to the Climate Accountability Institute, I'll leave the link in the description to the session. And even if we turn the whole music industry completely green, there is just as much we can do as long as these companies proceed in their activity and the governments keep supporting them and uh, keep subsidizing them with the faulty policies. So my question is uh, essentially to everyone, but uh, let's see artists, since they have such a strong following, how can they be used? How, the, how can this following be used to talk about this overpowering side of the environmental crisis? <laughs> Um, 
I guess I can I sort of speak from, from, from my experience how I do it. So, so yeah, I think you, you make a really good point. And Cle- Clem was also talking about it in terms of like the, the reach of artists and, and the reach of the music industry and the arts and, and all of that. Because I, I was thinking about it when I was uh, drawing up plans for, 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 for MIF. It's like in terms of our actual environmental footprint, comparing it to another company, it's actually small. But actually, what's the power that we have? We have the power to influence, we have the power to engage, and we have the power to communicate. And I know, Tatiana, I might just be quite a utopian thing. You're talking about the, these companies that are all run, and forgive me for kind of assuming it, they're probably going to be run by men of a certain age and whatever. It's like, but who are the artists that their children are listening to? You know, who are the artists? You're never quite sure which way influence is going to work out in the world and the connections that are going to be made. It's not saying that, yeah, don't think about it, whatever, but... I feel like there is a sort of societal wave movement that's happening where people are now actually starting to ask people like, what are you doing about it? What are you doing about it for, for your company? So maybe that's one way that the, the, the artists can do that through, you know, influencing their, their audiences, their followers to ask questions of their parents, you know, like, and, and, and the places that their, that their parents are working. And it's, it's not very sexy. It's not very kind of like, Ooh, out there, but like, writing to your politicians you know like if you if you have a, a, a issues with your with with political systems it's you know i know things aren't the same in, in countries all around the world but people need to engage with the systems that that are in place and see what see how they can uh, sort of push them to change and it's just by i think by people demanding change from their governments is how things happen i don't know if that's too utopian to be thinking i think this is just a unity of voices. I mean, they have to, they have to propagate the whole ideas about how to make this world more sustainable. I mean, there are artists with the millions of millions of fans and uh, particularly for our festival, for example, it is, which is a nonprofit, right? It's a very tiny town, but we need that, you know, raising the awareness. How can we do that? That is why the artists who are attending the festival I mean, these are the artists who agreed exceptionally to come to that place on a very, very low fees, only to cover transport costs. You know, sometimes a very high class artists, you know, and you would be surprised to know that they are compassionate. They feel that they have to share the mission. And we ask, ask them one thing, you have to tell about this more. I mean, you have to propagate the knowledge about this and just contribute into our mission. That's what they can do probably. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, basically, artists and whoever represents artists need to lead by example, really. I know it maybe sounds utopian, but that that's the, that, you know, I, I, I see this as the only way, um, you know, artists are able to shake the world um, when it comes to, you know, bringing live music back about, you know, supporting, you know, various causes that are close to their hearts and, and, you know, for, 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 for sustainability and, you know, the environment to be very high up on, you know, festival goers agendas or whoever steps into a venue. Um, it starts with, you know, it starts with the people that they're going to come and see really. One example, Tatiana, one example. Pink Floyd, they made a song about RLC. It's called Louder Than Words. Just watch the clip. It's one of the best video clips shot about the environmental disasters. It's Pink Floyd, and everybody talks about it now. I mean, there is also this example of Coldplay not willing to tour until they figure out how to do things. And as much as some can see this as a marketing move, the Coldplay had, has such a huge fan base that wants to go to their concert and they have a very definite reply to the question why they can't go to their concert. And like it, it, it kind of forces you to care, you know, like one time it maybe will not, will not do that, but then eventually you'll start looking into the reason why. And, and that will just help. Also, going back to the Green Rider thing, really wanted to give props to Paradigm because they were the first agency to send me like on a more global scale, the Green Riders, and that pushed us 
to care about that more. And what we're going to do now is we will try to teach our local artists how to adapt their riders and to make them more green because we're definitely falling behind with that. But if they want to tour Europe, we want to make sure that they know how to do that so that they look good, so that they know how it looks and how it can be achieved. So by the example that, let's say, Paradigm or another big agency that's good on the agenda and has all the green riders figured out, they will send that to us. We will use that example to give it to our artists to show how it's done. And it's just an issue of everyone trying to get involved and help each other figure this whole thing out. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Indeed, an issue of everyone trying to get involved and everyone trying to, to help each other figure this thing out without any shaming. Uh, as Shemata mm -hmm. said earlier, that we are taking it one step at a time. We succeeded in one thing this year, we'll succeed in another thing in addition to that next year. Uh, really feeling hopeful. Thank you so much for sharing all of these wonderful examples from your um, work, from your careers, from your professional um, endeavors giving us concrete examples of what can be implemented. Maybe some viewers will get inspired to implement some of these things in their communities, in their projects. Let's see. And thank you so much for the discussion. It was very fruitful and very interesting. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you guys. Much. Yeah. Thank really you so much. You thank you. It was a pleasure.